back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In this episode, I interview Matthew Milioni, who was my first touch point with the nonviolent community after watching a video on just war, which started to convince me um, that nonviolence was the way that Christians were supposed to live. I think this discussion is particularly important because we get into more of the the practical sides of things. So we still discuss some of the um, maybe more theoretical types of things, but we're going to get into discussions about what is the implication for my involvement with voting, with the police, with going to court, and those sorts of things. Very practical aspects of how we live out like Christ. And there are a bunch of questions that we talk about which we don't really answer because there is gray and things are difficult to apply consistently. So I don't want you to think that uh, I have all the answers or anybody that I talk to have all the answers, but rather that we are working this through together, trying to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And that's really where we're going to end this episode at, with Jesus Christ being the focal point. And that's what I love about so much of the nonviolent community, because it feels like you know, everybody would say that, all Christians would say that, but the nonviolent community, it seems to me, really does put Christ at the center and says, I know Jesus, and I know that he's real, and I know that what he commands is right, and I'm going to interpret everything through the lens of Christ, rather than Christ through the lens of everything else. So I hope you enjoy this discussion, and I hope it's helpful and doesn't leave you with too many questions, but enough to keep you humble. You know, for me, going through, coming to pacifism, uh, nonviolence was, um, it was very clear once once I started going down that road and just, I mean, the cumulative case is, is right. very strong. Um, but like I told you, a lot of what, what made me receptive to that was the politics that was going on in my mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so after I, after I got the nonviolence thing down, it was just inevitable that as I started to think about politics, you know, if you can't bear sword, there's a whole lot of sword when it comes right. to, to government, especially when you're, you're the top dog of right. an empire and uh, you run your army all over the place. So that was, that started me thinking about government a lot. And so I, I just did a se- season. I tried to kind of make a cumulative case, um, you know, for, for my thoughts on government, but there's still, there's still an imagination problem that I, I think I have because, you know, especially when it comes to something like voting, which seems innocuous and mm-hmm. seems like it's actually a responsible thing to try to help your neighbor. Right. Um, I want to kind of get in, into voting and um, because I, I think a lot of people have this assumption that, that government is a good right, and it's a good that Christians should be involved in and nobody really ever explores that. Right. And, um, and then the flip side of that is nobody ever really knows what any alternative is because right. the only thing we know is government. So right. I, I want to get at those two assumptions tonight. Um, Great. So, yeah, I guess the first question I would have for you then is when it comes to government, one of the most common retorts that I hear to, to Christians withdrawing from government is that we are then shirking our duty to be mm-hmm. salt and light in the world. Mm-hmm. And during the 2016 election, that really nagged at me because I didn't see a moral way out. Right. If I voted for Trump, that's immoral. If I voted for Biden, that's immoral. And if I abstained, that's immoral. And, and, but Yoder taught me, uh, helped me to see that, you know, you can't be a consequentialist. Like morality doesn't work that way. Right. And then I found your video entitled, uh, voting and abdication of responsibility. Right. And, and. It was hard for me to digest that at the moment, and it seemed kind of crazy, but at the same time, I didn't see an alternative. And I was wondering if, if maybe tonight you could kind of explain your view of voting and, and talk about that and, and kind of just flesh that out. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- should we jump right into that? Are you ready to start? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. So so let's let's analyze um what what the democratic process is from from a christian worldview a, a part of the problem i think in the case that we make for for christian non participation in civil structures is that 
um, it's a fairly easy case to reconcile out of the scriptures. Like n- n- nobody really thinks that that Christians are advocating the Roman Empire. It's certainly not in the first century. Um, this persecuted outlaw religion doesn't have anything to do with the state, but that's almost the problem of the case is that people say, well, well, if they had had a democratically elected representative style of government, then of course the Christians would have been involved. And this makes a lot of assumptions about, about our process. And it makes a lot of assumptions about us. I have a, I have a, um, when we when we look at the Old Testament and what God's doing with Israel, like w- w- the saga of the Israeli experiment, the Hebrew experiment, in God setting up a, th- a theocracy for those people, they aren't satisfied. They don't want it. Like they do, but they don't. It starts all the way back at Sinai, right? Like you go and talk to God for us. We want an intermediary. So that's the first problem is like this aloofness that the Hebrews have from their God. And then then as they as they're singled out by Jehovah for this particular experiment to be his particular people, they they don't like they don't embrace that persona either collectively. And so the 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 appeal to to Samuel is we want a king like the nations. We see everybody else around us is doing things this way. We want to do that too. And in in the lament that follows from the prophet, it's not God rebukes the prophet actually and says they're not rebu- they're not they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Because I wanted to be their, I wanted to be their head. I wanted to be their leader. I wanted to be their, their all. And I, m- my contention is that when God sends His Messiah, the Anointed One, the just like Samuel anointed David, like the Anointed One, uh, like the the archetype of all the Anointed in Jesus, He's establishing this kingdom. And trying to recast this experiment that the Hebrews rejected. Like, how much more explicit can I make it, Jehovah says. I'm sending you my son to be your king to establish my nation on the earth. And it's even a grander experiment than happened with the Hebrews because it's not, it's not, it's locus isn't geopolitical. It's it's not stuck in Palestine. It's it's pan-geographic, pan-chronological, pan-ethnic. And so, so this ought to be our root identity as Jesus' disciples. My connection with, uh, with an African Christian or a Chinese Christian is more comprehensive than my connection with a non-Christian American. But that's not sensible. We have a lot of... I, I was on a podcast this morning talking about the same issues, and I think that it's we have to admit that it's a big ask, right? Like we're asking people to transcend the thing that humanity has built out of itself, these tribes and nations and identifications along these kinds of lines. It's a big ask to to look at the Christian community and say, let's transcend who we are as a nation. Let's transcend our nativity. Let's transcend the things that our eyes see that we're connected to in this specific locale. And let's get out of that and see the world the way that God does from a much bigger perspective. And I think that's where a lot of people miss it. So now let's let's zoom in from that very high order, let's zoom in and look at the democratic experience. What are we doing when we cast a vote? See, the, the appeal has been for a long time. Like there's, there's a certain mythology. I'm sorry for those notifications that keep popping up, but uh, there's a certain mythology of, of, and we should expect this, right? Any, any, um, any nation's going to build a sense of self and there's going to be a, 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 a mythological framework of who we are and what we're doing in the world. This happens from, you know, you have small animist tribes who have religious ceremonies that, you know, from their perspective are the reason the sun comes up or the reason the rains come or whatever the case, they're saving the world, like literally preserving the world through their, through their story of who they are and how they interact. 
And, and it's no different with the West. Like we have this sense of self, this sense of identity of who and what we are, who we are and what we're doing in the world. And, and, and all of that runs in our political experiment in the U.S. Because I think we distinguish ourselves as Americans in this political experiment of, of American representative democracy. And, and to be quite f- fair, I mean, there are some beautiful and novel things about the experiment as far as, um, as, 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 far as men's political structures go. But but if we zoom in and analyze, when I cast a vote, what am I doing? Um, my thoughts were shaped quite a bit by Lysander Spooner, who wrote a small treatise called um, uh, The Constitution of No Authority. Um, and Lysander was uh, uh, a critic of the Constitution on a few premises uh, he's an early anarchist, and what he says is that why are we why are we subject to something a that doesn't it isn't representative? It, he said even then in the 1800s it doesn't represent women, it doesn't represent children, it doesn't re- represent African Americans, it doesn't represent a whole bunch of people, so it's not representative in the first place. And second of all, if it has value and merit, let people choose to be subject to it instead of being forced to be subject to it by the accident of birth. So that's his basic rationale. But when he examines the democratic process, not just it's like conscription by birth, but what we're doing is compelling our neighbors to follow our will. And and he says the fact that someone votes is no proof of his um, endorsement of the system. Most people vote because it's either rule or be ruled. And in that case, he he likens it to to a soldier on a battlefield. He says to presume that there's animosity between the two men shooting at each other is not, it's not right. All kinds of people shooting at each other have no ill will towards each other personally. They just are representatives of their country, of their respective countries. And, and because of their situation, they find that either they have to shoot at them and kill the person in front of them or be killed by the person in front of them. And the democratic process runs very much the same way from Lysander's perspective, that when I cast a vote, I'm, it's, it's ultimately defensive. It's me protecting my own interests in a, in a gamble to try to get my way instead of having others' will imposed upon me. Well, that begs the question, why are we willing to force our will on our neighbors? So I'm always... What what's not a hard sell generally for people is that when you look like when you look at like a monstrosity of an election like Trump or Hillary, which is nobody's happy about. And I mean, everybody's holding their nose regardless of which side of the aisle they're on in that election. When when you look at that, it's it's an easy sell to 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 talk to the Christian community and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be involved in this. And they'll say, yeah, OK. And you can you can even get some people to agree that federal elections with its, uh, you know, different appeals, maybe it's abortion, maybe it's militarism, maybe it's colonial expansion, maybe it's economic oppression, whatever the case may be, a sympathetic conscience can rationalize that national elections are probably not a good thing. But where where it's hard to get people to concede is in local matters and in moral matters or social matters. And this is the place where the Christian community really feels obligated, like you said. Like I, I feel like it's I have a moral obligation for the good of my neighbor, whether that whether my I consider my neighbor um the the African American kid down the street who's likely to be bullied by the police or an unborn person in my neighbor's womb, like I feel constrained to vote for these things that may have a moral impact in the world. And and the problem with those notions is that let's take the most ben- benign example we can. Let's talk about let's talk about uh, my local city wants to wants to levy a bond for a library or a firehouse, and I think the uncritical position says, "Well, just decide if you want a library or a firehouse in your neighborhood, and say yes or no. What's the big deal? This is how we make decisions in a representative democracy." But when I analyze that action, what I'm really saying, 
because our structure runs on forced taxation. What I'm really saying, if I vote yes for a library bond, is that I'm willing to conscript the guns of government to force up to 49% of my neighbors to pay for something that they may not want to pay for. That's really when you boil it down what my actions are. And and Lysander says at the bottom of every ballot is a bullet. Like what we're doing when we vote, when we use the democratic process, is we're conscripting the guns of government to force and compel those who may not disagree with us to do what our will is is electing. And that's a problem from from the perspective of a Christian conscience. Yeah, so I'd like you to speak to um, when I talk with my wife about this. So she she's on board with with nonviolence, like right. makes tons of sense to her, right? Um, at, at this point, anyway. Uh, but the the government thing is still very difficult um, for her because in in her mind, and I think this is true of a lot of people, it's this idea of well, isn't it a false dichotomy to say that I can't serve God and the government. I mean, like I can be the president of a business. I can, I can have leadership in a business and serve God. We don't think that those things are antithetical. And, um, so I think what you said there at the end, and maybe you could just expound on it a little bit more, because like I said, I, I came to this, this position because I was nonviolent first, but there are a lot of people who aren't nonviolent first, and I don't see how to, really argue governments against government so well, because they'll just say, well, I can be for the kingdom and try to help my neighbor through legislation. If you don't see a bullet behind the ballot, how is there a way to go about discussing government before? Or, or maybe you don't, or maybe you don't care about a bullet being in the ballot, but, but if you do, yeah, it's the, the question is, how does government operate? Like government is a coercive structure. And I think that Leonard Verduin's work in Anatomy of a Hybrid is fantastic to this end, that there, there are two ways that God is operating in the world. One, uh, it's, they're actually not original to Verduin, but he uses them. One is conserving grace, and that's what keeps the world running. And one is redeeming grace, and that's the church calling people into a new order. And the conserving grace is is how we're reading Romans thirteen, where we actually we actually so I I consider myself a Christian anarchist, but that position is relative to me and my people. It's relative to the church. I don't actually think that anarchy is a good way to run the world. I think that 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 structures that God ordains, whether it's Nero or Pharaoh or Pinochet or Saddam Hussein or Kim Jong Un or whoever it may be, like the order that runs in the world is doing the same thing in every time and every place, and and that's worth some analysis, right? Because it's a it's a big claim to make. How is how is Bush's America and Un's North Korea doing the same thing? Well, in either respective location, you can't steal from the market. You can't indiscriminately kill your neighbor. You can't walk around doing whatever you want. There's an order in place in the world, whether you live in North Korea or America. Now, some of those orders are relatively better than others in comparison with one another, but they all have the same ultimate function. And that ultimate function is to keep men from descending into anarchy, to being ruled by whoever is the strongest or whoever, like consolidating power into warlord chieftains where the world can't operate or hold itself together. That's the function of state. And that's a wise function of state. It's a benevolent function of state. It's good that the world has those powers to hold it in that relative framework. And and that that I think that's lost on a lot of people. And where where I would what I would say is that let's look at Romans 13. And I feel like sadly a lot of non-resistant Christians are kind of gun shy from Romans 13, but it's really it's really a powerful dynamic chapter for for embracing this notion of two kingdoms and not not least of which you know the pronouns in 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 the text are are us they focused like they bear not the sword in vain i e not us we don't bear the sword they do but but beyond that 
What I always tell people about Romans 13, if we want to understand the civil structures and how they're a part of what God's doing in the world, we need to understand how Paul can write Romans 13 and mean Nero as the punchline. Because that's the essential task of any textual analysis of Romans 13. You have to get this to square with Paul and the nascent church's experience with the Roman Empire with Nero at the head. So what's being written about these power structures directly applies to Nero. So if you can find out how this makes sense in Paul's framework for Nero to be the one that he's talking about, that's not a terror good to good works, that's good for us, that's God's ordained minister. If you can figure out how to apply that to Nero, then we can figure out how this applies across time and space. And and the way it applies is exactly in this way. There's an order that's being preserved. And this is really, I think, a genius, a stroke of genius from God, because I think these structures no no matter where or when they are, they have the same function and they have the same motivations. So analyze the motivation. If you're the governing authority, your interest is to take, to fleece the people. You're like, you're like the shepherd of the flock of that society. So the the shepherd, you know, he wants the fleece from the sheep, but he wants to keep the sheep alive because the fleece is the product that he wants. Well, any any civil structure wants taxation. And in order to have taxation, in order to prosper as the ruling class of any social order, you need a stable environment that can produce things so that you can pull your piece off. This is what every state structure has done for all of time. And that is essentially a coercive structure. Like by definition, it's a coercive structure. It says, give us money. And and to the extent that we need to, we'll give things back, whether that's roads or health uh, services or infrastructure or protection or whatever the case may be throughout the ages. So, so the state wants as stable an environment as possible, as stable and productive an environment as possible so that the state can prosper because that's what the state wants. So it's kind of like capitalism, right? Like it, there's this built-in incentive and corrective framework. And in the, in the case of civil structures, you know, because this is, this is the world that's being controlled, not predominantly the church, these structures, when they get out of bounds, when they're too oppressive, when they're too controlling, then there's rebellion, revolution, a new order gets put in place, and the new order becomes the old order. Like the new order has the guns now, and the new order has the taxes, and the new order makes the rules. And then it has to find this balance line of keeping people fleeced, like properly taxed, and also not rebelling. So there's this like internal framework for civil structures that keep them on some sort of even keel throughout history until there's a toppling over and a new erection of a new order. But but all of that, all of it has coercion as its main engine. Like the currency of state is coercion in every time and in every place. And this is the question for the Christian. Can we run the levers of the machinery of coercion? I think the answer to that is no for a whole host of reasons. But if we can get people to look behind the curtain and see who the little man is, the little man is coercion. The little man is the sword. The little man is do this or else. And that's not necessary. There's some benevolent reasons for the state to do that, whether it's, you know, uh, whatever. Pick your benevolent example of the state doing something good, making roads, you know, so that there can be interstate travel or or passing laws that you can't hurt people, whatever the case may be, the good things that the state does there. It's not that they're all bad. In fact, they're absolutely essential for preserving order, but they're but they have to have because no one will do it. Who's who's paying taxes that isn't coerced? Like if the government said, here's your tax bill, pay it if you want. I don't care if you're talking 2000, 3000, 4000 years ago or last winter. If the if the if the state says, "Here's what we would like from you, but there's there's nothing we're going to do if you don't pay it." It doesn't get paid. Like money and coercion is what makes the state go round. And when we when we engage with that structure, when we pull its levers, and this is why it's different than running a business. This is why, like, like people will tell me when I'm critical of of 
of participation in voting, they'll say, well, what if we vote in the church on if we're going to meet at seven in the morning or 10 at night? Like, isn't that voting? Isn't that? No, it's not. It's not voting in the democratic sense because no, there's no coercion behind the vote. Like if the church votes to meet at 10 in the morning on Friday and you don't want to meet at 10 in the morning on Friday, don't come. Like there's no teeth to the vote. There's no when I cast that vote, I'm not forcing anyone to do anything. It's a different thing to figure out what a group of people how to develop consensus and say how many people think we should do this and how many think we should do that is a separate endeavor than putting the guns of state behind that decision and forcing certain people to go along with the majority. Those are very different propositions. Yeah. Um and that that's kind of the conclusion I've drawn is that the state is problematic because of coercion. Um, and, and so, yeah, I have a hard time talking to people about abolishing the state before I talk to them about abolishing the sword. It just seems like the one precedes the other. Right. Um, The other, the other interesting case to be made when we talk about these issues is, is those, those moral social issues, whether whether we're talking about a, a, a abortion or or the defense of marriage or whatever particular social moral cause someone wants to take up and uh let's let's doma was the big one during the bush years right like the defense of marriage act and whether or not homosexual ma- sexual marriage was going to be recognized within the US um civil process and it was a it was a darling cause. Uh, in fact, the homosexual agenda, quote unquote, goes all the way back to the institution of the moral majority in the eighties. Like that was a primary rationale for the moral majority under Pat Robert, Robertson and those guys that started that up, and stopping the homosexual agenda. So, so this was like the issue du jour for twenty or thirty years within within evangelical the the moral majority the whole evangelical wing of the Republican party. And, and okay. So first, where did it get us? Like it, it didn't work. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know how pure the motive was in the first place, but whatever the case, it didn't work. But here's the thing for all of the time and energy and money that was spent on and passion and, and whatever kind of like backdoor deals were being wrought. When I look at the world around me, if if I say, okay, the world is losing a sense of what God was trying to do in marriage, right? And and the the world is losing its moorings around me and can't tell what God's original intention was with marriage. How should I approach the world around me? Well, I can stand outside of Walmart and get people to sign up for my for my petitions and I can raise money for lobbyists and 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 get out the vote and get myself to a ballot box and pull a lever whenever I think it's appropriate or someone that will support my agenda. The problem with those people that supposedly support the agenda is that they're they're just playing with those people, but let's assume they're not. That's one way. And the other way is to have a good marriage, to demonstrate to the world around you what it means to live in God's peace and harmony that he intended for a husband and wife, to, to walk around in, in the institution that you're trying to defend and to show it to be what it actually is, what it was designed, how it was designed to function and to prove the life that, that creates wellness out of these things. I liken it to this. I say, okay, imagine that Senator Warren, the senator from my state, she she pr- she proposes legislation in this in the United States Senate on the floor tomorrow, and she says, uh, "Gravity's really got us all down, and and I think that we should suspend gravity on Tuesdays between three in the afternoon and seven at night, so that we can all take a break from gravity." And this becomes a huge national cause to suspend gravity on Tuesday afternoons. 
if if my response to that is to go down to the local grocery store and try to get people to sign the petition to protect the institution of gravity, like how dare these liberals threaten God's creation? God created gravity and the principles of this world, and how dare these people think that they can undo God's ways by passing these unholy, unjust, unrighteous laws against gravity? If I were to do that, you would think I was a nut job and you would be right. Like if you want to defend gravity, just pick up a rock and drop it. Like you don't have to fight over things that are true. Like whether, whether it's, it's trying to defend gravity or trying to defend mathematics or trying to defend the law of sowing and reaping. Like if the world really is created out of these things, as we claim that they are, you don't have to defend them that way. It doesn't work like that. They either are or they aren't. And it doesn't matter what people say about it. And I think this is the case with these social issues. Like the case of abortion is a little more complicated because there's a justice issue involved. But but when you look at something like the Defense of Marriage Act and, and its failure, it just doesn't make sense to approach these things this way. And then there's this whole issue of trying to get the United States to act like Christians when they aren't is, is an absurdity at face yeah. value. I, I think what helped to clarify what you just said for me was the anatomy of a hybrid book. Um, right. Because it, putting, putting the word sacralism on mm-hmm. it explains so much of my Christian upbringing and so much right. of our, our Christian society. And it explained why when I was debating not voting in 2016, um, like I was almost an anathema. You know, I could, right. I could refuse to help at the food pantry, just like 99.9% of the congregation. Cause what good's that going to do to go help, right. help people and give them food? Nothing. But to give my one, 137 millionth of a vote, like that was religion practically. Right. And it, it so is religion. Sacred. Yeah. It's yeah. a religious prospect. Yeah. And, and I, I realized after reading anatomy of a hybrid that yeah, the, the reason that people were so offended is because we have a sacral order. Um, mm-hmm. And going to the ballot box is one of those sacralist um, institutions or, or activities. And it explained why why we want laws against homosexuality as opposed to just being salt and light. It explained to me why we're taking the Ten Commandments down, why, why that's a big deal to us. Right, because right. It's not so much the heart, like we want the image, we want the uh, facade of sacred. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and that kind of like that's what I that's what I refer to as the mythology of democracy. It's not just the act of voting itself; it's the whole machinery, the whole national machinery. Because like it was always a curious fact to me, like growing up uh, in a very in a very Republican. Um, conservative home why why things like get out the vote campaigns you know i I remember mtv in the 90s was rife with commercials to get out the vote get out the vote get out the vote you know campaigns on every corner in every small town in america get out the vote get out the vote well if 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 the case is that this is how we're deciding to run our lives, why why should you want your political opponents to vote? But they do. Like, if you listen to presidents, if you listen to elected officials, if you listen to to the propaganda that goes around with uh, the election cycle, what whether it's at the local or, or 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 national level, it's not about the outcomes; it's about the process. That's what that's what's trying to be entrenched. I mean, I'm not saying that the outcomes, people are indifferent to the outcomes. I'm just saying that when you listen to people talk about the democratic process, it's sacred in and of itself. Like, it doesn't matter who you vote for, just vote. It, like, that's what the whole, like, the whole thing in the, in the 2016 election was like, well, just write somebody in, but get out and vote. Well, what does it matter if I write in whoever? What if I write in my spouse or Mickey Mouse or whatever? People don't care. Just vote. You have to vote. You're an American. You have to vote. And the other part of the the other part of the mantra that's always kind of been a thorn in my side is that 
if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. And I'm always like, no, it's exactly the opposite. If you don't vote, you retain your right to have your own perspective. Like, here's my view is that the, the the democratic process, like especially when we look at it's another approach to the to the moral legislation is if you went and you say, OK, whether or not homosexuality is OK, whether or not abortion is OK, whether or not uh, buying politicians is OK, we're going to just put this up to a vote and I'll go vote for my side and you vote for your side and then we'll abide by the outcome. Well, then those are the people that don't get to complain because they were participatory in the process. They said, we will resolve this potential conflict through this means. That That's why I think the mythology of democracy exists, because it's the only way to keep 49% of people on the boat when they don't get their way, is that you got to participate in the process. You're just as subject to the whole thing as I am. Well, I've withdrawn my consent. I've said I'm not going to I'm not going to give you my authority. Here's my own personal story is that the last president I voted for was Bush the Younger and it was before 9/11, his first term. And I I was I was still a Baptist kid back then. And I voted to keep the devil out of the White House or whatever silly propaganda we were espousing at that time. And and I voted for George Bush. 9-11 happened and I had been kind of radicalized in my Christianity just before 9-11 happened. And I know I was I was a young person. I know if I hadn't been become a disciple, uh, a committed somebody committed to the kingdom of God, I would have joined the military after 9-11. It was just kind of the family I came from and the vein that I was in and my my paradigm and worldview. So I was personally spared through my own convictions. But But more than that, when that happened and the ensuing conflicts in both Iraq and Afghanistan and the bodies began to pile up by the thousands and hundreds of thousands and the atrocities raged on and we watched in horror as the neo-crusades of Western evangelical Christianity fought it out to the death with Eastern Islam, I felt responsible. I felt guilty. Because I had consented my authority for him to be the one that pulled that trigger. And and every time I watched a body count, I couldn't help but remember my name in consent to this power. And it sh- it shook me to my core. I felt personally responsible for the death that was happening on the other side of the world. And if I wasn't sure before, I was by then. I will never lend my consent to these men. I will never give up my personal authority. Like myself, that's a piece of me that I consent in when I take part in these processes. I sign my name. Like that's why the name is a part of the petition. Like you're you're lending yourself to this cause. You're saying, I support X. And I don't. I'm not. In in the case of a president, that's a blank check with your name on it to a man who carries around the potential to end the world. And that's when when you get away from the propaganda and the narrative and the sacredness of those traditions and just look at it for what it is from the Christian worldview, I just don't, it doesn't make any sense. It's not the way I feel like, I feel like our people, the Christians in America are every, in every way, exactly where the Hebrews were saying, make us like the nations around us. We want what they have. We don't want you. We want what they have. That's the consequence. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's a it's a bit inappropriate. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, have you ever seen George Carlin's skit on uh, on not voting? I'm sure I have. I don't recall yeah. it right immediately, but I'm yeah, sure I have. An atheist, uh, but he he's so insightful um, about a lot of these things, and he has he has a little sketch on on not voting that it uh, like I said, it's inappropriate at places, but it's, it's definitely insightful. Mm. Um, 
So when you talk about participation as kind of appeasing, so, you know, just, just get out and vote mm -hmm. and, and they want you to participate to kind of validate the system. Right. Uh, one of the, the stories that I, I remember you talking about in your video was that in the early 70s, in response to, to protesters, that um, government started to, to debate lowering the voting age. Right. Now, you had said in there, and, and I didn't know how to find this, I couldn't verify it, but you had said in there that as part of the debate, they were talking about how mm -hmm. like it was intentional in order to make the youth feel like they had a voice to kind right. of well protests right uh, I, i'd love for you to kind of use that as an example to um to kind of show how this isn't just you know paranoia or um, right. theory this is this is reality yeah there were two cases that 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 story i found in in a little collection of essays called electing not to vote um it's a it's six essays by six different authors and um w one of them was an african american author and and that person's take was that <clears throat> um, her her first point was that the civil rights movement had a much more grassroots effect before suffrage became the ultimate end of of the campaign. And I I, I I'm I don't think anybody um, nobody rejects the importance of of African Americans having the right to vote in a country that votes, um, to be s s oppressed because of the color of your skin is obviously an injustice and a horrible thing. But, but there were a lot of efforts happening at like opening up lunch counters or desegregating water fountains that had a really dynamic effect on local environments for the people that were living in there when those were the focus of of the outpouring of activism in the civil rights community and 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 some people this author included looked at at the focus on suffrage as venting the steam of that movement and especially when compared with the relative injustice that continued to happen after the civil rights kind of i mean there's a lot of it's a complicated analysis i mean mr king is shot and Kennedys are shot and all these horrible things happen at the close of that movement. And so what's what's attributed to what is just guesswork. But but the fact remains that that the oppression of the African American community continues in the South for many, many years after the Civil Rights Act has passed. So but the the fervor around activism over segregation seems to die off when the Civil Rights Act is passed. There's and then and then they go on to talk about this issue of the protest movement in America and how the youth especially were pouring into the streets. I mean, the '60s was such a tumultuous time. It's before my time, but it's it's probably my the most fascinating decade in the 20th century to me. I'm just, I, I it must have just felt like the world was about to explode or burn to the ground. I mean, you have all those assassinations, the president's dead, Mr. Ken, Mr. King was shot. Bobby gets shot. The there's race riots, Kent State. Like it's just like it looks like the world is exploding at that time, and 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 the race riots that happen and the anti-war protests that happen uh, are a major problem for the powers that be. The presidential administration is lamenting what to do with them. Even the whole war on drugs happens in large part in response to how to minimize that population. But on the other side of, of the legislative agenda was the senator who introduces the bill to reduce the voting age to 18, which passes. And I don't remember the details or the quotes, um, but you can find it in Electing Not to Vote. Um, the rationale is we need to give these young people a voice in the process. And when the voting age changes, there's a decrease in the protest movement. There's a decrease in the riot activity. And it does look like it gave people a feeling of, of involvement, a feeling of participation. But what, we, what it seems like, at least from my analysis, that it's not until the, the anti-war march on Washington 
that really breaks the back of the Vietnam War. When you have a million people show up in D.C. and say you can't do this in our name anymore is finally kind of like the death knell of, of the Vietnam War. And and it didn't come through voting. It, it, it again came through people showing up and not giving their consent to the powers that be to continue prosecuting a war that no one agreed with was right. So that that's how that narrative runs, at least. And I think there's some some good reason to accept that premise. Yeah. Um, I actually just, uh, you know, just finished a, a series on nonviolent action too, which was, which was helpful for me to see things play out in the real world and how, how nonviolence can be an infected, uh, an effective uh, influencer. Um, and right. it also strikes me, the thing that you mentioned about the, you know, protests actually being the thing that, that transformed, um, I know a lot of people in my community are against critical race theory, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, because it causes them to be introspective about things that we as the church have not dealt with correctly. Now, right. don't get me wrong, CRT's got major issues, but mm -hmm. it highlights some some very accurate things. And right. One of the things that I think it, it gets correct is that um, it, it basically says that you know after after these movements, the government the government legislation follows social consensus right um, or self-interest and so for right. instance you know that with um with the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. well right after african americans really get access to the vote um you you basically start to get the the prison system that mm -hmm. just ramps up and we disenfranchise right. tons of of black voters and so the civil rights movement the nonviolent protests they transformed the hearts of society and then the government stamps some legislation on it and takes credit for it. Right. And um, they kind of co-opt what, what activists are actually doing with their feet. They co-opt right. it to make themselves look good and to make people think that their votes were actually what caused the good to come about. Right. Yeah. And I think, I, I think another more recent example is, is Derek Chauvin conviction. Uh, I mean, I think that there was a sigh of relief that finally it looked like someone was someone with a badge was going to be held accountable for one of these actions. But it's hard not to recognize at the same time that if there hadn't been both very well documented evidence, video evidence, and a large nationwide protest movement. I don't think for a second that conviction would have happened. I don't think anybody who's being honest or has been watching would think that that conviction would have happened because there's been dozens of cases in the last decade that are the same way that there, where there were no convictions. So I think that's another example of how people using their feet and making declarative statements about what's right and wrong are, are moving the needle and changing the situation for people. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's even debatable cuz you have tens or hundreds of case studies that right. that basically you can see people getting away with it. So Right. We watched it. We watched it with Eric Garner. Yeah. We watched it with lots of people. So so, so in... that 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 makes another point about what really is effective in the world and it's interesting, you know, I I always laugh a little bit when people talk about non-resistance as some kind of pie in the sky idealism because i think i think voting is pie in the sky idealism to think that you're going to go pull a lever in a box as one of hundreds of millions of people and change the world is silly to me but but i've been thinking a lot about how we should okay so let's let's imagine we don't do what the hebrews did Imagine we don't want an intermediary. Imagine we want to embrace what God's doing in the world through us personally. And we want to be right there where he is, right there doing what he does instead of trying to create some kind of in-between, some kind of middleman, whether that's a process or an institution or a person or an ideology. If that were the case, then what I would do, if I wanted to say, what is God doing in the world and how is he doing it? I would want to look at Christ. I would want to look at his example, like because that who's the most successful 
who, who's the most successful person at instituting widespread change throughout the world? Well, it's obviously Jesus Christ. I mean, we stop and start our calendars with him, the whole rise of Christianity and across the world and all these things. The fact that we're here having this conversation, all attributed to this one man's life. And what did he do? He focuses on a few people and he makes deep, meaningful impact in the people that he can touch around him. And and this is a component of faith. And I think it gets to the heart of 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 my sustained critique of of looking at outside sources for how we should make a difference in the world. And and what I think is that there's an implicit notion that people often don't recognize that we're looking at the state as some kind of savior. We want the state, and it's ironic, especially when you're talking about conservative Christians who who kind of abhor the idea of the state saving people, but they still are looking at the state as a savior. They just don't see them. They just don't see that. You know, they they decry that notion if the state's gonna you know help somebody with food or medicine. But the fact that the state's going to preserve my rights or preserve my place in the world, they're both still viewing, both the left and the right are still have a savior position for the state. The state is the thing that's going to keep me right in the world. And and as opposed to that, as opposed to buying into that salvific nature of the state, if we look at how Jesus actually saves the world, it's through these very deeply rooted personal encounters, like where where a life touches a life and something changes, and then those lives go out and touch more lives. And it's the it's the issue it's the it's the principle of compound interest or 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 exponential increase that that if one person changes three change nine change on and on up the exponential ladder you have you can access billions of people's of lives i mean the six degrees of separation thing like these ch- networks that that lives create are the real institution that we should be tapping into to make a difference so if i want to if my cause is abortion i i have this is this is an interesting case study um I've been involved in in abortion protests. Um, I've I, I, I've I've done that before, and I've been seduced by the ideas in my youth that we needed to vote to end abortion and that that would be the how we save the unborn. My daughter is in in Uganda right now. We have a sister community in Kampala, and she works with a ministry called His Image Ministries. And his image ministries uh, is is operational uh, at Makerere University in the in the state of Uganda. Abortion is illegal. It's there's no there's no legal sanction for abortion. It's also very very common, especially in Kampala, especially among young students. And um, and so then, what do we do with that? What do we do with a place where abortion is illegal and common? Um, there you have to you have to in that in that instance the the state can't offer any more help like it's already illegal so what do you do if you care about those people those lives well you have to figure out why people would make that decision you have to look into the lives of it's not natural for a woman to want her child to die so why why is that unnatural thing happening? What's causing these women to be in a state where they can't they can't support the life that's in the womb? And the answer to those questions are there's a bunch of them, but you know there's abandonment, there's there's sexual promiscuity, there's um, a lot of pressure from family to. Pro- to, to go through schooling as, you know, a, a degree is seen as some kind of uh, cure-all out of poverty. There's all these reasons why women make these choices. And so what His Image Ministry does is connects with these women, tries to educate them about the issues at hand, and helps them work out the problems in their life that would lend them to making a decision like having an abortion. And and it's the only place that I, for all of the anti-abortion work that I've seen in the U.S., 
I don't know. I don't know if very many lives have been saved. I don't know very many people that have been turned away from the abortion clinic by by yelling or graphic signs. I mean, maybe it happens every once in a while, but 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 I know of many children who are alive in Uganda because someone took those women by the hand and said, "Let us help you find another solution if you want it." Like there's another way and we're willing to help you find it. And it's a much slower process, but we have women who go through that program who now work in that program. And that's the kind of change that that's what I think changes the world. So, so take another case, like what if you want to improve your neighborhood? What if you want a library? What if you want whatever? The way that the Christian community is supposed to impact the world is through these kinds of small, seemingly small encounters that are one life affecting another. And that doesn't, I don't know, I don't know if it's a, if it's our Western notions or it's particularly American, but that doesn't appeal. Like I want to, I want to, I want one action that will stop a million things or make a million things. I don't want to do the hard work of being involved with poverty. I don't want to do the hard work of being involved with medical insecurity. I don't want to be involved with the hard work of trying to work with women to figure out how their lives can be better so they don't have to make horrible decisions. That's hard. But I but I'm I'm persuaded by by my faith that that is the way to actually change the world because it's the way Jesus did. Yeah, and I think that that is one of the one of the difficulties that I have there with people who are not nonviolent is that they would agree with you about we should be doing the hard work, but again they'd say, "Well, thank God that uh, it is illegal there because that probably reduces the access, that probably is, you know, prevents some women from choosing it because of potential of consequences and mm-hmm. then on top of that illegality we we help and so that that's what I run into the most is just that it's a false dichotomy. The law is good, and we should be doing more. Yeah, I don't begrudge the law. I, I mean, the law is what the law is. But but the fact of the matter is, if you so so let's look at both sides of that of that legal issue from the Christian perspective. Like say say I'm um, say I'm a policeman in America as a as a policeman in america like a christian policeman in america my my religious sensibilities my personal integrity they all incline me towards the value of the unborn the this pro life position it's because of because of my religious propositions i still find myself in supporting that network as as being the arm of coercive structures i still have to I still have to obey my obligation to the state, and in that case, persecute people who are speaking against it in certain situations. Okay, so now let's now let's flip the coin on the other side, and let's say I'm a Ugandan Christian policeman. Now I'm rounding up women who have chosen to to engage in abortion. Who uh, l- let's just think of the some of the women that 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 Chloe's worked with uh, a 15 year old girl who was r- raped by her family and left on her own that was looking for an abortion. Uh, let's, let's round up a young girl whose whole family is going to disown her and ostracize her and leave her alone with no access to, to resource in the world if she chooses to have a child. And as a policeman, now I'm going to, on top of that, haul her into prison and ruin the rest of her life. Like, none of these are good scenarios, like from the Christian perspective. And there is access for the Christian community to actually make a difference in both cases. Like, so as a genuine Christian operating from the perspective of the kingdom of God, I can have positive influence on both sides of that legislative scenario. But as the one who's a participant in the state structure, I'm potentially oppressive in both sides of the structure. So it's a lose-lose or a potential win-win. No, that's, that's a very helpful uh, explanation. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and and uh, going back to one of the things that you talked about with with the the voting, you know, it it almost sounded when you talked about like going and you know pulling this lever that just like makes things go your way. It sounded almost like magic to me. Right. You know, some, sometimes when you talk about it, it's, it's almost like magic. Um, right. As if me pulling a lever will change society versus me going and getting involved with my neighbor. You know, right. I'm going to pull a lever to change my neighbor, or I'm going to feed my neighbor, clothe right. my neighbor, love my neighbor. Um, and so talking about loving others and community, one of one of the other big uh, influential individuals in my life has been Stanley Hauerwas. So starting to read him. Mm-hmm. And he, he is somebody who also kind of talked about voting as a coercive event, you know, that politics essentially breaks people up into factions and, mm-hmm. and kind of pits them against each other. Because right. if I'm in the 50.1%, I get to tell the, the 49.9% what to do. Right. Um, and, and so in light of politics as, as factionalization, how, how are we as a church an alternative? Because so, you did mention your church voting. Um, and, and even though there wasn't coercion behind it, isn't isn't that still factionalized to pit one group against another? So how does how does decision making in a community like the church? How should this understanding of, of voting and uh, community and love and collectiveness, uh, collectivity? How should that influence us as the family, church body, and and they, even to the broader society? Like, what's the alternative to voting? Oh, okay. Well. I mean, I think I think deriving consensus, like h- how many people want X or Y, and what are the relative merits of X or Y, is is a is a is a different interest than who, who's going to make the other side conform. Uh, when when if we're asking ourselves, like, what's the alternative to voting? In in what sense? I mean, if I'm going to have a, if I'm going to have, a, a, if we're going to ha- send around to to my church communities and say, hey, would you guys rather have go camping on Thursday or Friday or two weeks later? Um, there's a potential that somebody's still going to lose out, but the interest of that is is really f- f- hearing people what what people want, like what's the best for the most. And 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 it's also not leveraged through these coercive structures. But but if our, if we're asking ourselves what's the alternative to voting, like I mean, there's Quaker oriented consensus or unanimity, but those things are slow and difficult, and and they're they have relative merits depending on the importance of 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 the consideration. So you know, if you're deciding something that's going to change everybody's life, uh, having consensus orientation around unanimity is you know, that's something that the Quaker people have done for a long time and it has, it has something to recommend it. But if I'm asking myself, what's the alternative to voting in my, in, in the broader community, like in the world around me, one of our, one of our communities the other day has been really eager to, it's a newer community in a new neighborhood. And, um, they've been eager to, to, get to know their neighborhood, connect with their neighbors and trying to make a difference and, and, and trying to figure out how can, how they can be meaningful, meaningfully, um, useful to their neighbors. And so the other day they went around and picked up trash in the neighborhood. No, they saw something nobody else was doing. Uh, how, how, what's the value? What's the relative value of, Voting at the going down to the city council and complaining about the trash on the street, and can we get the council to vote on higher fines for people throwing trash on the sidewalk versus the Christian community going out and just picking up trash and being seen and known as people who care about their neighborhood? The church in Kampala has done the same thing, and it's an entirely different proposition in Kampala because. People don't have people don't use trash cans in Kampala like they do in the U.S. So these are the alternatives. Like when when 
I, I love when people accuse the church of being um, not civilly responsible because civic responsibility is like, that's our jam. Like that's what we do. We're all about the people that we live around. We're all, but it's all in a local context. It's all about the people that we know and live with. And that's so much more meaningful to us, to us and to our communities than what's happening in the electoral process. And I don't, I don't negate that the state has value, that it's not doing things that are meaningful. I mean, the fact that there are building codes and houses don't fall down or that there are fire departments and infrastructure and police departments and, and laws against crime, all these are perfectly normal functions, of, um, perfectly good functions of state. But when I look at I, I was I was describing it this way this morning. I was saying, you know, if we look at one of the things that's really helpful to me is to look at the church as a national entity, like as a national power. And, and, and as the people of God, as the nation of God under King Jesus in a real and present nation that transcends time and borders, we have our own kind of like... We have all of the things that a national power structure has. We have an immigration policy. We have a diplomatic policy. We have an economic policy. We have an immigration policy. We, we do all the things that a state does. And when you look at international relations, there's like this, there's this place where nations touch and they have either common interests or divided interests and how they navigate those common and divided interests is is interesting like okay so america with her european allies well that was really important stuff in the in the early part of the 20th century and they had a lot of common interests in the early part of the 20th century now it's becoming more and more stretched and there's less and less uh america with mexico is a lot of common interests, right? Because they share a border. They come right up against each other. And and I, I remember the Mexican army sending water into into Texas when the floods happened and because they were close and they could. And like the good of one side was good for the good of the other. And these places of cooperation and collaboration are good things. And it's good places where we can collaborate, where we have a common interest with our with the with the power in which we live. And so there are ways and places where we can where we can come together with with other international powers and have common interests and common goals, like the alleviation of human suffering. Like that's something that 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 sometimes states become involved in, you know, whether that's okay right now, whether it's the, like, look at the vaccination campaigns across America to try to, to stop COVID. Like that's a place where, where the state is trying to preserve human well-being. Now the st state doesn't always try to preserve human well-being. At the same time, we're trying to stop COVID here. We're sending armaments to Israel and, and supporting the bombing of Palestine and probably causing an epidemic of COVID there. So it's not that the state is consistent, but there, there are places where we can touch each other. If you're, I, I, your question is, what do we do in lieu of voting? Well, I think we don't look at voting as the ultimate end-all be-all of civil responsibility. Civil responsibility has to do with how am I a meaningful member of the community where I live? And I think I think voting is the least important of those things. It's the least meaningful of those ways. So let me, let me ask you because there were a number of things that you said there that I think uh, I converge. Kind of ramble. No, no, it's okay. Uh, it it converges into some other big like application questions that mm -hmm. that I've really struggled with. Um, so y you mentioned that like let's say the police force is right. a good and laws are. Are good, even though you don't think it should be wielded by by our hands, right? Um, and and I think a lot of Christians that I know, the reason that they would pursue legislation against those those mothers, for as sad as their stories may be, would be justice. And by justice, of course, American Christians almost always mean the negative justice to offenders, and right. as opposed to the positive justice of helping the poor and stuff like that. Right. So we we have this lopsided view of what justice is. Nevertheless, okay, if you're saying that the sword is bad, if you're saying that uh, Christians shouldn't participate in government, 
Um, and then you say that police are good and laws are good. I really struggle with knowing the, the suing somebody seems a little bit more clear and that would mm -hmm. be hard. And maybe you could tell, tell the story, you know, about mm -hmm. the dentist thing. Right. But then when, when it gets into something like, you know, the sexual abuse stuff in the church, right. Do I, do I not tell the police that somebody's sexually abused or I saw a murder? Do I not go to the police and say, Hey, I saw somebody killed. Um, somebody breaks into my house. Do I call the police? Cause I know that they wield the sword. Mm -hmm. And they're going to do it at my behest if I, if I call them. Right. How do I how do I square not voting because of sword versus calling the police because of sword? Right. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, th there's a there's a there's a few ways to approach that, and I think that um, David Brousseau does it well in the just war debate that we had here, and and he says that the the powers that be the civil structure and especially the sort of state is intended to keep people in line it's to control the passions of men and it ought not to be that those are christians whose passions are being controlled by the state in other words the the sort of the state is designed or ordained to control people who will not be controlled by christ so it ought not to be that the policeman patrols the neighborhood to keep Christians from killing or stealing or destroying. That that's not we've as as we exist as disciples, we're not involved in those actions. We have we have a we've transcended that in Christ to have a higher order. So Jesus says, "Don't kill." He tells us, "Don't be angry." Like the world says, "Don't commit adultery." Jesus tells us, "Don't." don't lust like the the order that we're being called to live under doesn't need the wrath of the state to keep our passions in control we have another mechanism for controlling ourselves now when people don't do that like in the case of sexual abuse in the church they fall back under the domain of the state as transgressors against the state's just laws so so if i'm asking myself okay let's consider two different examples uh, there's a fantastic book by the by the name of uh, Dial Nine One One. It's written by Dave Jackson, and he was a part of uh, the the uh, was it Jesus People? No, it wasn't Jesus People. Reba Place in Evanston, Illinois, in the seventies and eighties. And uh, Evanston, Illinois, was a very very high crime area, and there was. Um, at its peak, I think Reva Place had about 300 people living within a few blocks of each other, and they even had a common purse. It was a very interesting community, and it's worth reading up on some of the materials. I think, I think they still have a community there, but I think the tone of it's changed some since the 70s and 80s. But because they were in a very high crime area, the questions of non-resistance were very practical ones. Like they were being mugged and robbed and people were breaking into their houses and things were happening. But they also believed that the that the penal system was punitive in in and and destructive. So it was harming their communities. Like people being locked up and put into prison was detrimental to their community. It was hurting people. And so they were at a real, a real dilemma. And, he, and the dilemma is expressed really well in this way. <clears throat> if, I, if a man breaks into my house and ties up my wife and steals my things and leaves, it's all well and good for me to say, in Jesus' name, I forgive him. I'm, I'm not going to seek wrath. I'm not going to try to use retribution. I don't need justice. I don't need my things more than I need peace with my neighbor. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to subject him to the dangers of the penal system. However, when that same man breaks into my neighbor's house tomorrow and ties up his wife and steals his things, and he's not a Christian, am I morally responsible now because I didn't give the police the information who did have a proper domain to try to stop this from happening to my neighbor? And that's as succinct a way, I think, as you can sum up the moral obligations of dealing with, with the sword of the state. 
and 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 it's complicated like there's not an easy resolution to that when your own conviction is to love your enemy the one who would do you harm and take from you but you feel responsible for for subjecting your neighborhood and your community to people who are dangerous the the and they talk about how they came to their decision in regards to that process and how essentially if i can paraphrase the way that that community answered that dilemma is that they got to know the police department they got to know people involved in the justice system and law enforcement and they made a determination as a community that the juvenile system was redemptive that as they as they understood the people that were working with juveniles in juvenile detention, there were programs in place to try to get people off of drugs and addiction, to try to teach them life skills and to turn them out of the juvenile system with an attempt to make their lives better than worse. But the adult penal system was so destructive and so mm, intrinsically oppressive and dangerous and, and making people's lives worse, not better that if they felt like it was a young person who was involved in crime against their communities, they would call the police. And if it was an adult, they wouldn't. Now, I don't know that that's the right answer. I don't know that it's the right answer for all places, but it's, it's very heartening to watch a community try to reason their way through that moral dilemma in a way that's that's sensitive to everybody's to everybody's needs that's really trying to respond to what's the best for all people involved they also got involved a lot in like victim reconciliation and putting people together you know victims and perpetrators and doing you know mediation and reconciliation so there was it wasn't a one pronged approach but the stories like that where people are trying to find creative solutions to these dilemmas i think I think we don't do that near enough. I think another example of somebody trying to do creative approaches to these kinds of issues is Shane Claiborne in The Simple Way in Philadelphia. Like they're trying to find creative mechanisms to 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 challenge the powers that are that, that are oppressing people. And it, whether those powers are addiction or law enforcement that that there are mm, there are powers at work in the world that that are anti-human that are that are not good for human well-being and 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 i don't know that just looking and making a con a clear-cut decision like we either always do this or never do this fits the best good in in a lot of different situations so so another example that's more personal to me my wife um my poor dear wife She's an amazing woman. She's she's born me twelve children, and um, you know one of the tolls that that takes on a woman's body is is bones and teeth. You know the calcium that it takes to create a child is a lot. It, it takes a toll on the body in many ways. But my wife had uh, some some really difficult dental problems, and we went to a local dentist, <clears throat> and he was trying to do an extraction on a tooth of hers. And it wasn't going well, and she's not particularly easy to work on for for some medical reasons. And um, as he was trying to extract a tooth, he shattered a tool in her in her mouth. It's called an elevator. It's like a little tiny screwdriver, a little tiny flathead screwdriver, and they use it to pry the tooth up. And and she was sitting in the chair. She I was in the I was in the waiting room waiting for her. She's had very difficult extractions before. And uh, she was, she had typed on her phone, call the ambulance, I need help, and was waiting to push send. It was going that badly. So as he's working on trying to extract this tooth, it felt like all of a sudden, like somebody had just smashed her in the skull with a, with a baseball bat. And what had happened is that this elevator had broken in her mouth. And the, the dentist kind of got panicky and started doing x-rays and started working on her. And he's saying, do you need a break? And she's like, no, 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 just finish. I need to get out of here. Just finish. And he's like, okay. So he continues to finish and breaks up this tooth and pulls the pieces out. And 
and she's a mess. It, it's a horrible extraction. She, he comes out with her and he's like, she's not going to do well. It was a very difficult extraction. Um, here's the medicine she's going to need. You need to watch over her and make sure she's okay. Give us some aftercare instructions. And uh, she couldn't, she couldn't heal it up. Like the, the extraction site was, was, it was staying open. It was painful. Like she couldn't breathe because it, she had an open hole to her sinus through this extraction site. It's just a horrible, horrible situation. So a couple of weeks go by and she sits up in bed one night and her mouth fills with pus and a piece of metal comes out of her jaw. It's about oh, a quarter inch long that that elevator had lodged in the sinus in her skull and it was up so high that it didn't get caught in the in the x-ray that the that the dentist did so we had to go into the hospital and we took this piece of metal that came out of her skull and told them what had happened and it was a, a really messy procedure trying to get her her mouth fixed after all this so we went and talked to the dentist and we said, here's what happened. Why did this happen? Why did you leave a piece of metal in my skull? And he was somewhat apologetic, but mostly trying to just figure out how to deal with the situation. And we didn't know what to do from that point. Like we had incurred a lot of medical expense from from having to fix this problem that he he'd, he'd made. But the thing that weighed on us, you know, this is the kind of stuff that malpractice insurance exists for. And people get, doctors and dentists get sued for this kind of stuff all the time. And we have quite a few medical people in our community here. And, you know, it's the stuff of legend. Like, this is what people make million dollar lawsuits against practitioners for. And we knew that we didn't, we didn't want to do that. But the, but the rub was this, like, if he's not practicing dentistry in a way that doesn't hurt people and he's not being careful, he's not informing people when something tragic like this happens, this is dangerous. It's, it's dangerous to whoever else is going into his office next. So how do we resolve? Like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to try to leverage this for my own good or extract something out of him or get, you know, our pound of flesh for hurting us we want to we want to forgive we want to be kind and gracious but we also don't want other people to get hurt so what do you do our resolution was there are there are licensing boards that the state uses for these mechanisms and so what we did is we we let the licensure board in our area know what had happened they did an interview with Erica and examined the case and we left it in their hands like that's your job to figure out what should happen with this we're just here to testify what has happened. And I think when when you're looking at all these cases, the intention of the person who's engaging with the state power is the determination of its moral value. So what I mean by that is that if somebody breaks into my house and takes my things and I'm like, I need to get my value back out of those items and if i can find out who did that and make them pay then i then i'll be well uh that's what i want so i'm going to call the police and chase them down and try to try to extract at least some punishment for my own well-being if not if not my my value that's one motivation that people or or maybe let's make it a little more noble and say so he doesn't do it again so he learns his lesson that's one set of, of motivations for calling the police. It's an entirely different motivation, I think, to be to say there's something wrong that's happened in this community, and there's a state there's a civil structure that's designed to to have per, this is their prerogative. It's their job to to take care of people to make sure that the community is well, that cr crime doesn't go rampant and take over people's lives. And I'm. I'm alerting them so because it's their domain of authority to witness what's happened so that they can decide what's best to do. That's their job. It's their domain. That's, I think, a very different motivation. So could I, could I summarize and you tell me if this, this is kind of what you're saying? Sure. Um, because I, what I imagine the pushback would be is, well, when I go to vote for president, 
you know, I'm not voting to have them stop abortion and legislate against people and bear the sword. I'm just saying, I'm saying this is who is, is going to be in charge. And I'm just electing the person who I think is more moral. And I could see somebody saying that with the police, like, well, yeah, you're, you're telling the police, but you're basically informing the sword. And so I guess what, what maybe the distinction would be is, you know, if, if somebody steals something from me, maybe I go to the police and I say, Hey, look, here is, there's somebody who stole something from me. Here's what he looked like. Here's what happened. Uh, so in case somebody else does report this and press charges, um, you, you have more information, but I'm not going to press charges. This is, this is your domain. Right. Whereas if I go to the police for something like sexual abuse of a child or murder, that's not, I don't know about sexual abuse of a child, but I would imagine that I don't have to press charges on that. The state no. would take that into their, right. into their hands and they would pursue that themselves. Right. So by me going to the authorities and simply informing them and leaving it in their hands, that's not me choosing to wield the sword or pursue the sword. That's me just informing the appropriate authorities um, to do with as they wish. Right. And I think that I think that the distinction is to, to, to think of it like in a graphic example, it's the difference between being on a witness stand or being in a jury box. Like, am I trying to am I trying to be the the one who's activating justice or am I just the one who's telling what happened? And those are different places to sit. They're not the same. It's not the same. Um, it's not the same calculus to examine what's happening in those two different places. Yeah, and I, and voting seems more like being in the jury box because right. the candidates tell you exactly right. what they're going to do, and you're voting for a commander in chief whose right. job it is to be over the the sword. Yeah, exactly. And the other the other thing when like when we look at at uh, a, a some violent action or or sexual abuse or something like that, whether it's within the Christian community or outside of it. Those are those are places like when when Roman says that they bear not the sword in vain is God's minister to reward good and punish evil. Like that's the function that those that those powers are ordained for. Like they have a legitimate right within that structure to be to be doing those things. And so like when we look at a, a problem that's happened, especially within the Anabaptist communities, is when there's been things like sexual abuse or even domestic abuse, the church has said, well, we're a separate power and we should, we should just deal with this with ourselves in some certain horrible cases. And, and they have been exactly that, horrible cases. They've been perpetuating abuse and, and m- minimizing the experience of victims and just making a mess of the world in many different ways. And the proper view is to say, if, if you have, like, the proper view of the church in one of these cases, say a man within our community or a woman commits some uh, atrocious action like this, is to say, you by your actions have made yourself subject to the law. You need to deal with the law. There's two things you need to deal with. You need to deal with your your spiritual state in regards to the church, but you can't even approach that issue until you properly repent. And to repent means to bring light. Repent means to make things right that were done wrong. Repent means to turn away from the actions that you pursued that were that were sinful. And in order to repent, you need to put yourself under the subjection of the authority that you transgressed. So if you transgressed the if you transgressed a child, you're subject to the state for what you did to that child. If you hurt a person, you're subject to the state for the damage that you did. You have to give an account to that proper authority in order to put yourself in a place where you can realign yourself with this with the spiritual interests of the church. That's how the church should be looking at these kinds of issues. So it's not like we transcend them whether or not we transgress them. It's that we transcend them because our actions are above the need for their justice. But if we fall below that line of discipleship and fall back into the old man, back into the world, back into sin, back into defilement, 
then we put ourselves by our actions back under the place where we need the state's power to coerce and control us. So you have to deal with that state power when you are under their domain, their proper domain. That's how I rationalize those things. Okay. Yeah. And, and there are some cases where it's even simpler because, you know, when I was a, a teacher, um, I was a mandatory reporter. And right. so the state basically has a law that says, if I know that there's abuse going on, I have to give them that right. information. Yeah. Right. So I've got, I've got two questions left uh, and it, it's kind of going to switch up a little bit because it's, it's not so much about government, but it, it's kind of. All right, if I if I take the implications of hierarchy, coercion, all this stuff in regard to the state, how do I maintain consistency when I apply it elsewhere? Mm-hmm. And so one of the the things that I have struggled with is, you know, in my community, spanking was very normal. I was spanked growing up. I didn't view it as something abusive. Um, but at the same time, thinking about nonviolence, thinking about coercion, and also just I mean, I don't know what was in my parents' hearts when they spanked, but I know that there are times when there there is anger in me that I have to control and don't Mm -hmm. control sometimes. um, That I it it just I I I feel like it is it is not a good thing. Um, But at the same time, it it, it's very I kind of have these these two competing um, feelings about it. But I don't know how to discuss that in light of nonviolence. So, what is your view on like on spanking and how that relates with with nonviolence, coercion, et cetera? Yeah, it's a it's a it's another really interesting question, and I think it's good that we ask ourselves it. I think that I'm I'm inclined to see the parental obligation as a kind of unique obligation and relationship. Um, I, I, I'll, 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 I was going to say, I'd leave off the, the biblical rationale because it's so easy to dismiss as an old world view. Like, you know, the, 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 the assumptions that are made, like in Hebrews, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth betimes. And like that, that word is, is essentially a, a word that connotes corporal punishment and if 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 you don't receive that then you're a bastard like the assumption is of paul is and he says right there in that same passage he says our fathers chastised us for their own good pleasure like the assumption of of the world at that time is that this is the normal course for how fathers discipline their children and so <clears throat> so if we leave that aside and we just ask ourselves like from a basic premise what's happening with raising children and and how does it relate to to non nonviolence and coercion I don't know that the calculus is the same for this reason I don't think that children have the capacity to make decisions that are that that take into account future and consequence in other words if you take it, which is, which is more cruel to teach a child to listen? Like, so, okay. Say we take a little baby, uh, not a little baby. So we take a young child, a toddler, and we say, don't touch. And he touches and you, and, and you don't teach a child to listen to its parental authority. And the child is wandering around in the kitchen and you say, don't touch. And you haven't trained him to listen. And so he reaches out and touches the hot stove or the knife or runs out into the road or whatever dangerous action that he doesn't have the capacity to understand the implications of, which is, which is worse to, to, to flick the child on the hand or to give him a little switch and say, Papa said, don't touch. You need to learn when I say don't touch, it means you can't touch that or to not teach him that and allow him to become hurt because he doesn't have the capacity or rationale to make those decisions for himself. I think that my view is that we're given the responsibility over our children who don't have those capacities to be that capacity for them. So we have to do it in some sense. And 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 in what sense we do those do those things, uh, I, I suppose that there's a range of ways that we can do that. But one of them is to use corporal punishment. 
but here I feel like it's it's like calling the police. Like <laughs> it depends very very much on your motivations when you do these actions. What the what the moral outcome of them is? It's not the action in and of itself. At least at least not exclusively. I think you can use corporal punishment in a way that's for the betterment of the child. Um, or you can use it in a way that's for your own self and, and that the outcomes of that are going to be potentially destructive and damaging. So the, the, the crux of the issue for me is the, the capacity of a child to understand the ramifications of his own decisions that, that we are supposed to, as parents fill in the gap of that makes the situation different about coercion. I guess what, and, and I don't have a better answer, but I, I, I've had the answer that you've had before. And I think what makes me nervous about it is, you know, one of, one of the biggest realizations I had in my life was that I'm a consequentialist and my community is a consequential, uh, consequentialist community. And so to say something like, you know, what's more loving to teach them not to listen and then they run out into the road or to use corporal punishment, that sounds a lot to me like what people who voted in 2016 were saying to me. What's better to get Donald right. Trump and the and Supreme Court justices or to lose those seats? And so, right. I, I mean, I, I intuitively get what you're saying. But it's still, it's still just a, a rub for me, and it's it's very difficult for me to to navigate that gray. Yeah, there's certainly a rub there. I don't deny that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything better to say. I I think that, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what else I'd add. Yeah, I it's I, okay. I, what I, I think in short. Now. Yeah, it ha having raised raising my 12th child I think that I'm convinced that if 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 my wife and I don't do a good job of training our children to listen and heed to their parents the outcomes are so much more drastically worse for the whole person and maybe there's better ways to do that. I, I think that there's, um, I think that there's actually a lot of ways to do that. And one of those ways is corporal punishment. Um, I think that it's, I, I have a similar kind of view of like psychotropic drugs. Like I, I'm, I'm distressed by the, the overprescription of psychotropic drugs for for depression and anxiety and i think that pe a lot of people are having damage done to their psyches and their persons through through these substances but i also i also recognize that there's a domain where those things are life-saving and essential to some people and 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 distinguishing the signal from the noise in that case is a very difficult thing. And I think this is something like that, that, that there's, that there's a place, a time and a place where, where physical constraint of a child in one form or another is, is so much for their well being that it becomes necessary. But, but if that's the only tool in the drawer, you're, you're probably very far from creating healthy people. But I know that doesn't a answer your ultimate objection. No, and and that's good. I mean, this all of this has been a continuing dialogue, mostly in my head. But you right. know, recently, I've been I've been having more people to to bounce these things off of. So, um, I don't have all the answers. I don't expect anybody else to. But the more I talk about it, the you know baby steps. Right. Um. Okay. This is the the last question that I have, and it's I guess it's more of a, a theological sort of question. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to the, the voting government thing. But, you know, when I think of, of the future, when I, when I read something like Revelation, you know, it talks about Jesus ruling with a, a rod of iron. And then it talks about how, um, you know, to him who overcomes and does my will, 
I will give him authority over the nations and he will rule them with an iron scepter. Um, and it talks about us ruling over angels and uh, or judging angels. It seems like a lot of the the argument for um, abstaining from government is because Christ is king and we're not to be coercive. We're not to, to use coercive force. How do you square that with with the seeming implication here that we are going to have authority, political authority, I mean, because Christ mm-hmm. is our king and we're ruling and we're judging, and presumably with iron scepters. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, how do you deal with that? What does it mean? Well, there's a couple there's a couple ways that I that I approach that issue. Um I I often say to people when when talking about non-resistance, like if 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 I'm a disciple of Jesus, then I'm saying that I'm subject and liable to his teachings. Uh, like I'm I'm a follower of what he told me to do. And I said, you know, if Jesus had come with a sword in both hands, hacking the heads off of everyone who didn't do what he said, and also told me to love my enemies, uh, as a disciple of Jesus, I'm still subject to his teaching. Now, fortunately, mercifully, that's not what the case was. He was he was so gentle and so kind. But the question is, what did he tell us to do? And I feel like that's that's where I live, and that's what I'm interested in here and now. And there's so many parts to the eschaton and what God's intentions are in the future that are are so way out of my league. I don't know how to comprehend them. I, I don't know what it means for us to be like angels and to not marry or be given in marriage. I don't know what the new heavens and the earth are about. I don't know all kinds of things about the eschaton. There are some beautiful things about the eschaton and there's some wonderful hopes about the eschaton, but, but I don't understand so very many things that it's just not a place that I live. It's, it's not the place that I focus on how, how to be. There are things that I, that I leave open-ended for, for trusting God's benevolence and grace and, and who I know him to be as my father. But I, I also recognize that that's probably unsatisfactory for a lot of people. I, I think that God, you know, when when I look at how God operates in the world, especially as we consider, there's there's kind of like, I, I'm, I, I appreciate Mr. Boyd's writing some because I'm partial to open theism in particular, but open theism starts to go down a track at a certain point where it's, it feels like... Uh, uh, a very creative retelling of the Old Testament, you know, where God didn't really mean for the death of the Amalekites for every man, woman, and child to happen. Like there's this revisionist view of the Old Testament where we're trying to kind of take the teeth out of the problem passages of the Old Testament with Jehovah so that we can so that we can find shelter to to be the pacifist Christians that we feel like Jesus wants us to be. And I don't feel like those things are necessary. I think that, I mean, I, I'm not trying to get into a theodicy or deal with the Old Testament violence in, in this short time, but I think that there's something about the way that God works in the world that if he's the prime mover and cause for all things, he's ultimately... He has some something to do with life and death in and of itself. And and I'm willing to leave that in his hands as the creator who cares more about his creation than I do. Uh, like there's a certain place where I rest and I say, because I know Christ and because I know the Father, because of the, the things that, that, that he's done in my life, I have an implicit trust of him. And I'm willing to just implicitly trust him for the places where I don't I don't make good sense of what he's doing in the past or in the future. I'm confident to to live in the place where Jesus left me, which is with the sermon on the mount, with trying to with trying to redeem the world the way that he did, with looking at his crucifixion and resurrection as the key to unlocking what it means to be a whole person. And 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 
I'm willing to do that because it's creating wholeness in my life, in my family, in my community, in my churches, that approach to, to a Christocentric life, to trying to recapture what God was doing with humanity by looking at the logos as the model for behavior is vivifying. It's, it's creating life in my, in my life and in the world around me. And so I can trust him for the places that don't match that, that don't, I, I can't figure out how they work in, in, in cooperation with that. So, so at the end of the day, like another way to, to say it is that I often wonder like philosophically about the fall, you know, we always rationalize the fall through the construct of free will and I'm okay doing that. But but I don't know that we often run the calculus very deep. Like when Eve, like why why doesn't Eve, why doesn't God stop Eve? Like if the fall, if the fall is the precipitator for all the evil in the world, which you know according to Christian theology it is, it's the it's the place where all evil comes from. Like in that in that selection of the forbidden fruit is all of the war, murder, bloodshed, abuse, trauma, rape, violence, pestilence, famine, plague, and disease that the world is going to experience until the second advent. All in one singular action. It's wrapped up in that moment. And, and, and it begs the question, why does God watch it happen? Why, why does he allow that to transpire? And and I don't know all the answer to that. What 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 I've become unsatisfied with is the idea that that somehow that's a preservation of free will. Well, the devil could speak to her and it didn't negate her free will. So why doesn't God come and advocate against that counsel and say, hey, 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 whoa, look, you can do that if you want, but look, can we talk about it? Like, do you understand? Let me just give you a glimpse of what you're what you're inviting into humanity. But he doesn't. For, for for all the text knows, he just watches it happen. And and that's like the root of the theodicy, right? Like that's where the origin of that, all these things that, that transpire happen. And, and there are some approaches that I that I can take to that. I think open theism actually helps answer some of those questions, but but I also think that that it, a part of that analysis is that there are certain things that transpire in the world that can't happen in the pre-fall world, like like a savior, like a healer, like a redeemer. There are certain things that God is that that are not observable or possible to apprehend in a world without consequence and sin. It's a short it doesn't fill all the gaps, but it starts us towards the answer. And, and, and I move from there and I say, but I know Christ, I know him and I know what he did. And I know when I, when I hear him and when I, when I read him and when I study him, it moves me at the deepest level of being and i'm and i and i can't conclude he's anything but good and and other than me and i want to be like him and i want to understand him and i want to act like him i want to move like him i want to think like him i want to talk like him and 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 because of that f fixation on him i'm i'm learning who the father is like what his interest in the world and his creation is and how much he cares and how much he's moved by our infirmities and our weaknesses and our struggles and how much he cares about me and my tiny tiny little life and and after i come through that experiential funnel i say i say i can understand by faith when the apostle says the sufferings of this life are not to be compared with the with the glory which shall be revealed in the sons of god and i see i was at a funeral this morning for a baby i was speaking at a funeral for a baby who died last weekend in one of our one of our families lost a, a child and that's there's nothing good about that 
except for everything around it. Like the death, I hate. I hate the loss of life. And I think God hates the loss of life. I think God hates death. I think death is God's enemy. But at that funeral, when you watch a community come together and you watch people grieve together and you watch people love one another and you see how comfort comes into pain and you see potential for hope and you see something coming out the other side that doesn't get broken through death, then you can kind of start to grasp at this idea that God's doing more through our experiences with these ugly things than could have been done without them. That's how I approach it. Yeah. I think that that will be a good place to end. Um, you know, I know for me, so I, I attended uh, Christian school since like second grade, Christian family, pretty much everybody in my family is a Christian Christian Bible Belt of, of Pennsylvania, you know, Lancaster County area. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it wasn't until five, seven years ago, I guess, when, when we first talked and um, I, I went down the road of nonviolence. It, it wasn't until I, I was able to, to read Jesus's words apart from metaphor and apart from justification, rationalization, that I felt like I really met him right. knew him for real and most of my life has been i mean I, I wasn't a nominal christian like i i did good things i did the right stuff um mm -hmm. but I, I was just I, largely unmotivated you know you go to church every other sunday every sunday you know whatever right but um seeing jesus for what felt like the first time just five to seven years ago was life-changing and and what I love about what you just said and, and the stuff that Boyd writes, for as much as I disagree with him on certain things, this, this uh, cruciform hermeneutic or, or having Christ at the center, hmm. yeah, that, I mean, that, that's saved me so much pain and anguish, reveling in that uh, or, um, or um, lack of motivation because it's like I rest in Christ because I know who he is. And right. There's a lot of other stuff that I really struggle with in the Bible. But when you know Jesus, it changes everything. Right. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, uh, that last word that you had. And I think that's, that's the great place to focus. And yeah, uh, I, I, if, if we are focusing on Jesus, I think that will impact us rather than going and pulling a magic lever, actually going out into the community and, and being hands and feet. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you again for, uh, for doing this. Is there anything that you'd like to, to plug any podcasts that you do, any writings, whatever? Yeah, I, um, so we have a, we have a YouTube channel for the church followers of the way. Um, we put, we put most of our stuff out on, on the YouTube channel. That's a place to follow us. I have a few podcasts. I, I do one that started out of a silly little meme group. Um, Dank Kingdom podcast, we do, we put that out on Facebook and it's on YouTube as well. And I have another podcast. It's a project that I care very much about. It's called Talking in the Chasm. It's with my friend Felix Rust. He's a, he's an atheist and he's a very good friend of mine. Um, we sit down and we talk about difficult things. Uh, we've been on hiatus through the COVID scenario because he works with vulnerable populations of people. And so until we were both vaccinated, we couldn't really be together, but we just started meeting up again. And so the second season of Talking in the Chasm will be coming out over the next few weeks. And I'm excited. Um, I'm excited and scared. We want to talk about homosexuality and gender. We want to talk about some difficult theological issues. And the main point to Talking in the Chasm is to say that people can come from very different places and have some very strong disagreements and also be very kind and loving to each other. And I think we need, we need more of that in the world. So those are right. places where people can catch some of the other things that we're doing. Okay. I'll make sure to link those. Um, and thank you again. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. That's all for now. So peace. And because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it.
podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.